So the 124th meeting of the Maryland State Bar Association will come to order. Welcome members to the first ever virtual meeting for the MSBA. As you know, because of the pandemic, we had to, to cancel the in-person uh, annual meeting. So uh, we're trying something brand new here and I think the staff has worked extremely hard on it. Anyway, thank you for participating in this historic event uh, necessitated, by, necessitated by COVID. Uh, we hope everybody has been staying safe and remaining healthy. Uh, one of the benefits of doing a virtual meeting, I really believe that uh, it gives a greater access to a larger number of our members to participate in the normal uh, Saturday morning meetings on our Saturday. Uh, to ensure that the association's business is accomplished fully, fairly, and timely, please consider the filing standing rules for today's meeting. Can you cue the next slide? Is there a slide? Okay. Um, first of all, the, the agenda for today's meeting sets forth the order of business and the time for discussion and debate that has been previously uh, uh, delivered to all our membership at least 30 days in advance. Uh, second, that the time allotted for members debate on any question shall not exceed one minute per Per, per speaker. There we go, standing rules are up there. Third, that the uh, MSBA staff and designated staff members shall administer and report on the use of the electronic platform utilized for voting. And finally, that the meeting is scheduled to adjourn at 5.30 p.m. or following the inaugural, inaugural address of the new MSBA president. If there is no objection, the standing rules will be approved. If there are any objections, uh, you need to type the same in the, the uh, chat box and we will take it to a vote. But if there are no objections filed, uh, the standing rules are approved and they will determine the course of conduct of the meeting. No objections having been lodged, then the uh, standing rules are, are adopted and that will be, uh, once again, the rules of the meeting. Uh, next on the agenda is the uh, report of the officers. Uh, and that is me. Uh, the report of the president, my year in review is what it's entitled. So I don't have a, I believe we have a video to show at the moment. No. Well, here I am, the 2019-2020 president of the Maryland State Bar Association. Although a lot of members refer to the coming year as my year, I do not. It is the year of the Maryland State Bar and its members, and I just happen to be president. We will continue the effort to meet our members throughout the state, geographically, organizationally, and professionally. We have been invited to county bars, specialty bars, MSBA sections and committees in all areas of practice. I've been invited in just the last few days to several events that will be attended if at all possible. We like our constituent parts and want to hang out with them. Maybe just to come and say hi, but you will see us. Welcome to the 17th annual Annapolis Summit. The Maryland State Bar Association is our presenting sponsor. Why the Bar Association is doing this? <laughs> well, I think it's important that the Maryland State Bar Association for its members and for the legal community have a presence in Annapolis. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going on here. There are going to be a lot of changes this year. And uh, we've been involved uh, in, in the legislative session for since the, I guess the MSBA has been created. We have a legislative liaison, we have a laws committee, uh, so we want to be part of the process. We want the, the, our legislators and our government to know that we are present, and that our members know that we're present also, that we're looking over things for them. I hope everyone is safe and hunkered down for the long haul in this stressful and unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I just want to say thanks to everybody for continuing to try to make sense out of the what, what's going on in the world right now. Everything's kind of been turned upside down, but as, as uh, volunteer leaders, we, you are appreciated. I am very proud to be the president 
of this organization during this time of need because they've responded so well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Uh, that being said, uh, I will say my time is short. Today, I realize that a year of experience has finally prepared me to be reasonably competent to be the president of the MSBA. So it must be my time to go. But we are in not good, but great hands to move forward. Our incoming president and I, along with the MSBA staff, have been working cohesively for several months to assure a smooth transition. And I, I have to say that Judge Skirty is ready, willing, able, and prepared to move this organization forward with the support of the incoming officers and an outstanding MSBA staff. And reflecting on my year, you have seen a few of the highlights in the short video. Of course, most of that occurred prior to the pandemic. The last event I recall that was live was in DC when, it, when COVID was first really becoming an issue. The, amended, the many attendees were kind of awkwardly not shaking hands and banging, banging elbows. No mask, no social distancing. Was that ever foreshadowing of, th foreshadowing of things to come? Always first on my agenda is to restate that I believe in the mission of the MSBA and understand that mission more clearly now than ever. In brief, that is to serve our members and to be the voice of the legal profession in Maryland and more broadly, nationally. The organization has been faced with many challenges this year, unprecedented challenges that are unresolved and will continue to be challenges in the uncertain future. Nothing has brought that into focus more than the crisis of COVID that has so dramatically impacted all segments of our, of our society. And I do believe that the MSBA, its leaders, its staff, and its members are meeting a challenge as painful as that may be. Although you will hear more, of this, more on this later from our incoming president, Judge Skirty, another challenge that the MSBA is pledged to face as stated in my statement on the part of the MSBA on March on June 2nd, 2020, is to be part of reforms that will bring about advancements to protect people from equality and prejudice. Being president of the MSBA has been a privilege and an education. At the outset, I don't think I really understood what a privilege it actually is. I also didn't grasp how much of an education I needed. But I can say now, today, I am ready to graduate. Some of the observations from my experience as president are, are as follows. First of all, thank goodness, under the direction of our, our executive director, the MSBA made a total commitment to improving our technology and platforms uh, over the last several years. When the, pandemic, when the pandemic closed just about everything, we were able to go completely remote and still serve our members in the profession. This meeting is one of those examples. When the MSBA was in essence closed, one of the first things I did, we did, was to reach out to the leadership of the judiciary to ask how we could participate in a constructive way. I sincerely thank Judge Barbera, Chief Judge Barbera, Chief Judge Morrissey, Judge Ripken, Pam Harris, and the administrative office of courts for their positive response to our participation at whatever level would be helpful. I am very aware that the judicial leadership has worked tirelessly in a very trying situation to come up with meaningful and safe solutions as the courts reopen. I congratulate them for the effort and their planning. This state has some truly great and dedicated lawyers that are professionally minded, com com community minded, and have made and will continue to make a difference. One thing, another observation is that one thing we don't have enough of and we need are more lawyers participating in the, the legislature. Participating in Annapolis at the MSBA lobby days, the legislative breakfast and being instrumental in carrying the message of oppositions, opposition to the sales tax on services bill reinforces that legislators as lawyers are a pressing need. Additionally, I have a much better understanding of diversity in the broadest sense of the word and a clearer vision that the second part of that phrase, inclusion needs work. The MSBA is dedicated to pursuing that goal within our organization. 
that the MSBA has many moving parts and within those parts, many personalities. It is no surprise that as great and generous as lawyers can be, at that times they can be, shall we say, somewhat obtuse. I, ha I have been in, it has been interesting transitioning from transitioning from traveling the state hither and yon to deciding which room of my house was best for a Zoom and positioning the camera to hide the fact that I was wearing shorts. Communicating with bar leaders around the country, such as the ABA president who is uh, going to participate later in this uh, proceeding, uh, has not only reinforced that we are moving in the right direction, but also that we are not alone as a voluntary bar in trying to modernize and better serve our members and our profession. It has been rewarding to be surrounded by officers and executive council and MSBA staff that has been so supportive and holds such promise for the success of our organization going forward. I firmly believe based on many, many positive com comments, registrations for our canceled in-person annual meeting, registrations for this virtual meeting and positive renewal numbers that the statute stature of the MSBA has been raised in quarters where we seem to have been little appreciated before. That is most gratifying. And everyone attending this virtual meeting as voluntary leaders deserves part of the credit. As a side note, I just hope this translates into renewals and new members. We need the profession support just we, as we have tried to support the profession in this very anxious time. Thank yous. I thank the past presidents that I've worked directly with, Deb Schubert, Judge Pamela Brown, Judge Harry, uh, Judge Harry Storm, Sarah Arthur, Judge Trufer, and other past presidents that have offered to provide whatever support I needed. And I did call a few times. I also want to emphasize how important this year, year's executive council has been. They have been there all the way and as a unit helped guide me and us to some difficult but good decisions. The officers, plus Meg McKee, Tom Yeager, David Shapiro, and Nate Reich as the young lawyers representative, and of course, our executive director. Our boards and sections, I also acknowledge and thanks for their leadership and participation. They carry the message of service to our members. I cannot overstate the value of our MSBA staff. To say they have been dedicated does not do justice, led by Vic Velasquez and our dynamic as our dynamic executive director and Anna as second in command. They're what makes the organization run. I've been repeatedly amazed at how they are able to take an idea and turn it into reality. Vic Velasquez. It is difficult to describe how hard he has worked to push, shove, and pull the MSBA into a modern, responsive leadership organization. I describe him as a forward thinker. He sees things, anticipates, and then executes. The MSBA is very lucky to have such a talented and a dedicated executive director. If you don't know, he is nationally recognized. I've enjoyed our 50,000 phone calls, texts, and emails over the last year. Of course, tomorrow comes and I will probably never hear from him again. <laughs> that is a joke, of course. Uh, my final thanks goes to my wife, Sandy, And my family. At the outset, at the outset, I was gone too much, quickly followed by I was there too much. Sandy's support, advice, insight, and patience, at least sometimes patience, has been crucial. I am a lucky man. Once again, I thank you all. And in roughly an hour, I will receive the distinguished title of immediate past president and willingly accept that mantle. So thank you so much. I now call on the report of our executive director. Thank you, President Williams. And that's very difficult to act to follow. Uh, the reality is that this organization has been extremely well served and I have more comments to that effect uh, towards the latter part. I've got six or seven slides to talk about an entire year's worth of activity. The reality is that in, uh, in May of 2017, the Maryland State Bar Board of Governors voted to begin a transformation, to take part in a journey. And uh, President Williams just alluded to it. Over the last couple of years, uh, we have been making investments and making changes. And that board 
in May of 2017, led by then President Harry Storm, recognized that we needed to continue to evolve in order to be able to address the concerns not only of today, but of tomorrow and those that we could not ever anticipate. Uh, in fact, it's because of that journey that we've been able to do some of the things that we've been doing the past few months uh, during these unprecedented circumstances. Let's get to some slides and I'm gonna share with you a journey worth of uh, pictures. This has been indeed a year of fighting for members, members, firms, the profession. Um, it, was, it seemed like ages ago that there was the specter of taxation and legal services, something that we uh, focused on immediately that resulted in us placing ads that you see on, on your page there, uh, doing uh, testimony, lobbying, rallying support, getting thousands of folks. You see President Williams in the midst of a, a press con conference where we were focused on telling our story and why we believe that taxation and legal services was not positive for our profession, for businesses, for the public interest. The reality is that we needed to marshal all of our resources. A strong, resilient state bar can be potent when it comes to issues that affect our profession. And it's important to note that we were able to successfully, in partnership with other organizations, successfully defeat the specter of taxation and legal services. You see a lot of other images there. And President Williams talked about Lobby Day, our focus on letting our legislators and our members understand uh, that the tens of thousands of attorneys that we represent uh, are a voice that should not be ignored and in fact can serve as a resource uh, in each legislative session. You see a picture of Delegate Barron and Senator West who uh, co-sponsored legislation uh, that was pro our profession and our practitioners. Uh, and you see other visuals around some of the content that we put on uh, during this pandemic. So from taxation and legal services, we, we woke up one day and all of a sudden we realized that we were in a new world. In fact, around uh, COVID, we've now had over 20,000 hours of online learning that the State Bar has provided at no cost to both members and non-members. We've had uh, coffee talks uh, with hundreds of attorneys. Uh, we've had webinars specific to COVID, 31 webinars in fact. Uh, you see a, a, a set of numbers there on the slide that was through at some point in May and through just a couple of days ago, we've had 31 webinars with 22,000 views. We have been working hard this year. And we as a state bar have been adversely impacted by COVID. You'll hear our treasurer make some remarks to that effect, so I will not cover it, but know that we have been working hard. In our next slide, part of our efforts have been communicating to our membership. Center of that slide, you see our reopening business considerations guide for the legal community, a 30 plus page document that was intended to serve as a resource uh, you've seen our bar journal, which has had an evolution, uh, plenty of publications that we have put out, the state of the profession uh, report that we put uh, forth. We've been busy. The engine of the MSBA has uh, been busy. And this is all happening, as you go to the next slide, uh, in a year where we expended a tremendous amount of energy to put on the biggest show we've ever put on. Uh, President Williams talked about the fact that he was... Uh, pleased by the numbers. Last year, we had over 1,100 participants. By mid-February of this year, we already had over 500 plus registrants and participants, and we were projected to go well past the 1,100 that we had last year. It was going to be a phenomenal three days in Ocean City with 80 substantive sessions. But as you know, it was not meant to be. In fact, some of those sessions we are now beginning to still hold the actual trainings, record them, and deliver them to members. We are shortly going to be announcing to the general membership and you as participants of this business meeting get an opportunity to hear that we are within weeks going to renew our commitment to the profession, specifically to our membership, and allow them to have free access to our virtual online learning. More to come on that. And as we move on to the next slide, we recognize that virtual is important, community is important. The Maryland State Bar Association for 124 years 
has been focused on creating community, but you cannot always do that in person. We doubled down on in-person this year and you see some of the images. We held over 100 in-person events before the COVID situation took place between sections, committees, uh, formalized events. Uh, as President Williams pointed out, our connections events uh, started to hit multiple counties, a continuation of efforts under President Trooper who said, let's get out there. Let's get out into this great state and let's meet our members. And we've been doing that and we did do that. But you also see visuals uh, around Zoom chats and we're all now familiar with the Brady Bunch uh, visuals that we stare at most of our day. We have at this point had between our webinars, online learning, our meetings, we have had over 30,000 individuals participate on some virtual meeting and function. And while we're thinking about that, we recognize that it's more important now than ever to establish and to support virtual community. Again, we're not walking away from the fact that we will always be an organization rooted in connecting in person, but we struck a partnership with Treble and the Treble platform is essentially what I like to call uh, move over LinkedIn. This is LinkedIn on steroids. It's the ability to grow, manage, and most importantly, leverage your network of contacts. Uh, contacts. And the Treble uh, solution is free of charge to our members because we recognize that in this environment, it's important to not only have in-person opportunities, but to create virtual communities and make sure that the profession is connected more so than ever. I was just having a conversation with uh, former President Harry Johnson. And he talked about the fact that in this environment where you can't get out and about, uh, people can get isolated. And it is bar associations, we're gonna hear from the president of the ABA, bar associations like the MSBA, bar associations like your county and specialty bars that convene the voices that allow us to connect and remain part of a profession, remain part of something. And it's very important in an environment like this. Uh, I will just share as we continue our slides that uh, our communications and uh, the investments that we've made, the processes that we've changed have allowed us to do a lot. Uh, I won't get into what's on this slide, but we have just done a lot in terms of solutions. You see something called up content, which is the ability to curate uh, legal news specific to you as a user. We've, we've begun piloting that. We hope to continue to roll that out and lots of other communications tools, vehicles, uh, including our video uh, biographies of our members and focusing on the face of our members and understanding the content and the technical substance, substantive issues that our membership are interested in hearing about. So as I continue through this presentation, um, I will say that uh, sections uh, I've said many times uh, are the lifeblood of this organization. I uh, mentioned we've had uh, uh, 20 coffee talks with over 400 attorneys that are geared towards sections and we continue to provide the marketing, the support, and we wanna do uh, more uh, in the days uh, to come. I know that uh, President-elect Skirty has talked about the desire to continue to engage and support our sections. It's an important, in fact, I wouldn't even say important, it's a critical element of who we are. So as we continue through the presentation, I do wanna make a special point uh, around a partnership that we have with the Maryland Legal Services Corporation. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the MSBA and MLSC uh, forms a partnership and we have something called the honor roll. And essentially the honor roll is geared towards uh, acknowledging those organizations that pay above uh, market and favorable interest rates on IOLTA accounts that helps support the funding for civil legal aid. Uh, it's a partnership that uh, we think is very important. And for this business meeting, we wanna welcome Wells Fargo to the IOLTA honor roll. Susan Ehrlichman and the team at MLSC do a fabulous job. We recognize that there are headwinds uh, for that organization and its ability to fund civil legal aid organizations. So it's more important than ever for us to highlight when business and industry and specifically banks and financial institutions step up and allow us to fund. So welcome to Wells Fargo uh, for the honor roll program. And, and speaking of partnerships, uh, the MSBA does a lot of good. I often get the question, why should I belong? And, and I will share that we have a tremendous amount of content for members in just about every segment of the profession. We certainly have lots of valuable resources that we provide. And, and to the right of that slide, 
you see our partner organizations, those that we're proud to support, we've created them all. Uh, and we have an opportunity to do good, whether it's allowing high school students to get out there, uh, allowing us to facilitate pro bono legal services, funding our, the communities that we're in through our Maryland Bar Foundation or our Access to Justice Commission, which has just announced a partnership with the Attorney General uh, and the creation of the Access to Justice COVID-19 Task Force. But what I wanna leave you with in our session today is that in addition to all of that public interest work that the MSBA does, only possible by virtue of your dues dollars, we also help hundreds of attorneys who have substance abuse, alcohol, mental health, and other issues. And we do so confidentially. You will never know that someone to your right or to your left, virtual or in person, may have been helped by this program. And we're helping many now as we're seeing an uptick driven by the COVID situation. And there's a toll-free number. I wanna give special credit to President, immediate past President Trufer, who amongst the many things that he accomplished in his year, rolled out a statewide program that allowed us to have our members pick up the phone and see a counselor uh, within their county and not have to come to Baltimore City uh, to get assistance. All of this happens because there's a family, a village as it were, if I move to the next slide, and, and frankly, I get an opportunity and I have the privilege and I have the great privilege of serving as your executive director, which I am honored to do. But you're seeing the faces of a team and President Williams talked about them. These are the folks behind the scenes. Some of you may, you may see and some of you may know, but others you may not. These are the folks that make it happen. When I joined this organization, there were over 30 employees. We are down to this strong and lean, mean machine because the economics of Bar Association land requires us to get lean and mean. And we have been reducing our expenditures for multiple years in a row. These smiling faces are the folks that get the work done and they are all to be commended. Uh, and I uh, just thank them all. And, and last but not least, as I bring my presentation to a close, I asked my team to put some pictures up of President Williams and I, and the only picture they came up with was that one of the two of us looking miserable. And all I could say is I have stood next to President Williams all year long, uh, literally and figuratively. He has been outstanding uh, as your leader. In fact, I don't think there could have been a better president in terms of temperament, in terms of commitment, in terms of interest and in just doing the right thing. It is not an exaggeration when Dana Williams says 50,000 calls. We were talking all the time but the calls were always consistently across the same theme. The theme was, what do we need to be doing? What's our consideration here? How do we help the members? Uh, Dana is the quintessential leader because he doesn't come with pre prescriptive solutions. He comes with questions. How are we doing? What do we need to be doing? Did you know this? Uh, I'm pleased to have spent this past year with Dana Williams. Uh, in my short time at the Maryland State Bar We've had tremendous leaders and the leadership legacy of excellence continues. Dana, I just have to say, thank you so much for all that you have done, not just for me and for the staff team, but for the tens of thousands of members, some of which will never know the doors that you've opened, the arguments that you've taken up, the issues that you have said, we need to get on top of this. It's important that those listening to me right now recognize you have been an exceptional leader, and I thank you. That's my presentation. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the MSBA treasurer, Natalie McSherry, for her report. And thank you for those comments, Vic. Thank you, President Williams. Thank you for everything you've done to lead this organization. and. Um, I second everything that Vic just said, and I want to add to it, and I see that a couple of people have already written comments in the, in the chat room, but Vic and the staff at the MSBA make us all look good, and we all do, owe them all a huge, a huge thank you for everything they've done, especially in this very complicated year. Um, from a, a financial standpoint, before COVID-19 came wrong, um, the MSBA had been performing significantly better than the year before. Through mid-February, uh, the revenues were 15% higher than the year before and expenses were 17% lower. We had hit 96% of our membership target 
So things were looking pretty good. And then COVID-19 came and unfortunately resulted in three plus months of virtually no revenue. Um, we couldn't put on programs. We couldn't have our, as Vic's already said, anticipated to be terrifically successful summit. And so to address that, uh, the MSBA had to take painful step of furloughing some staff and modifying some of their supply and service agreements in order to try to weather the storm. We, want, we were glad though that we did not have to invade um, our reserves, but we did use our line of credit. I'm happy to report though that for the first seven weeks of our dues campaign this year through day before yesterday, um, the MSBA has had 7,000 and better members renew, pay their dues already for next year. That is significantly ahead of last year at this point in time. So we're now projecting based on the impact from COVID-19 um, for this first part of the year with no revenue that the um, MSBA will end the fiscal year at about 20 to 23% under our annual revenue budget. You will of course get a detailed report later in the year because our fiscal year ends today um, with, with more details about that, but that's where we anticipate it will end for the year. I do wanna thank um, those 7,000 plus lawyers and the many, many, many solo practitioners, small firms, in-house, corporate government, public interest, transactional litigation and, and large firm lawyers who have already committed to 100% of their attorneys being renewed. We've had an incredible number of firms that have already ensured and practices have ensured that all of their lawyers have already paid their dues for this upcoming fiscal year, which starts tomorrow. So I wanna thank all of them and encourage everybody else who may be in attendance today, if you haven't yet paid your dues for this year, um, we would love it if you would, because we use that money uh, to do all of the many, many good projects that are done throughout the year. And that um, President Williams would conclude my report. There is a slide, thank you, with all of those law firms and, and entities that have had 100% renewal already. Thank you very much. That's it for me, President Williams, unless anybody has a question. Next is the report of our secretary. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanna uh, uh, thank uh, you and uh, the other officers and the uh, uh, executive director and his team for uh, an amazing year under uh, unbelievably difficult circumstances. Uh, and with that, um, I have no other report. Thank you. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to have uh, the ABA president, Judy Perry Martinez, to uh, to make a presentation for, for the group, for the Maryland State Bar Association. Uh, before she speaks, I just want to give you a little background information. Uh, she is a, the president of the American Bar Association, the largest voluntary association of attorneys and legal professionals in the world. She is a Louisiana uh, attorney and she is from New Orleans. Over the past 35 years, she has held various leadership positions with the ABA, including chair of the Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary, uh, ABA, she's been the ABA's lead representative to the United Nations. She's a member of the ABA Board of Governors and its executive committee. She has served on numerous ABA committees dealing with critical issues in law and society. She, serves as, she served as chair of the ABA's Presidential Commission on the Future of Legal Services and its Commission on Domestic Violence. She's been a member of the ABA Commission on Women in the profession, the ABA Task Force on Building Public Trust in America and the American Justice System and the Council of the ABA Center of Diversity. She, uh, is a, she has also been a practicing lawyer. She was a commercial litigator uh, and she also worked in the corporate world in North, at North of Grumman Corporation, which is a Maryland corporation. And um, she did a, once when she was between those events, she worked as a, for a year as a fellow in residence at the Advanced Leadership Initiative 
at Harvard University. Uh, she did return to Simon, Perrigan, Smith, and Redfern, where she worked as a commercial litigator. And she is partner and member of the management committee. She has also held several leadership positions within the New Orleans and Louisiana State Bars. She has won numerous honors, uh, including the Capital Def Samuel Dalton Capital Defense Advocacy Award from the Louisiana Association of Criminal Defense Council, the Distinguished Attorney Award for the Louisiana Bar, uh, the Alliance for Justice Award from the National Gay and Lesbian Law Association, the Michelle Petard win professionalism award from the ah. Association of Women's Attorney and from the Louisiana State Bar in 2017. She got the lifetime achievement, the David A. Hamilton Lifetime Achievement Award uh, and the New Orleans Bar Presidents, Association's Presidents Award. She is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Bar Foundation, a fellow of that foundation, the Louisiana Bar Foundation and the American Law Institute. She graduated from the University of New Orleans and received her Juris Doctors with honor, her Juris Doctor with honors from Tulane Law School. I now turn the podium over to Judy Perry Martinez, the ABA president, and I thank you for your participation, President Martinez. Well, thank you uh, to all of you for inviting me to be with you at the uh, virtual annual business meeting of the Maryland State Bar Association. I was hoping I could be in person, but it's still good to join you online and to recognize President Williams' outstanding year of service and to celebrate the start of the term of your incoming president, Judge Skirty, none of which is possible, as I know we've all heard and we all know and have witnessed without the dedicated staff that your State Bar Association has that supports the work of the officers and so many more. Um, Dana, thank you for that introduction. And I know as you go out in your year um, that you will have had a year of wonderful fulfillment as you served all the attorneys and the public within your state. And Judge Skirty takes office as we acknowledge at the ABA how grateful we are for all the state and federal judges who are rising to the many many challenges that we face here in our country. And we know that, we will con that they will continue to think innovatively about how justice is delivered in our country. We know this firsthand in the ABA because of our judicial colleagues in the ABA Judicial Division and other groups that address issues ranging from administrative law to civil rights and social justice. The ABA has a strong and close working relationship with the Conference of Chief Justices and the US Administrative Office of the Courts on matters ranging from court funding and operations to access to justice before and during and after the pandemic to lawyer and judicial mental health and wellness. We heard about that a few moments ago and its importance to regulatory reform and innovation and beyond. And the ABA is proud to involve judges in our activities every step of the way as we need their very valuable perspectives, authoritative, legal knowledge and critical leadership to promote the effective and now transformative administration of justice. Maryland judges like retired judge Tony Clark, a former chair of the ABA Judicial Division who represents the National Conference of Trial Judges in the ABA House of Delegates now. Like Judge Pamela Brown, Maryland State Delegate in the ABA House of Delegates who chairs also the ABA's Standing Committee on Bar Services and Activities Judge Brown's service at so many different levels of bar work in your state has proven to be a major asset for uh, the ABA Standing Committee on Bar Services and all of its work with state bars across the country. And all of you should be so very proud of her work um, in the local state and affinity bar world. And indeed the ABA fosters collaboration and involvement from all types of bar associations. Working separately, each of our organizations can do terrific work. But when we work together, we are a force multiplier for justice, for equity, and for equal justice for all, for diversity and inclusion in our profession, and for a vibrant legal profession that strengthens competence and ethics and serves the legal needs of our clients and the public. And for an independent and fair and impartial judiciary, and I, ask you to pause with me for a moment and think about that. 
because judges, we all know, are at the front lines of justice and therefore are vulnerable to personal and often dangerous political attacks and personal attacks. It's our responsibility as lawyers at the ABA and in the bar associations across this country to explain and defend the role of courts and judicial process to the public. So I thank all of you who have personally taken up that responsibility and taken it to heart. The ABA also promotes judicial excellence through our longtime public service of evaluating nominees to lifetime positions on the federal bench. Our standing committee on the federal judiciary chaired two years ago by Marilyn uh, delegate and, and Maryland resident Pam Bresnahan performs its evaluations solely based on those professional qualifications. Your past president also, Harry Johnson, served um, with distinction on that committee. And the evaluations that that committee does are authoritative, thorough, widely respected, and absolutely necessary to help ensure the quality of our justice system and preserve the impartiality and independence of the judiciary. And the ABA leverages the power of state bar associations on values like a vibrant legal profession that is empowered to give confidential, unfettered advice to clients, free from government overreach. We heard a few moments ago about the important lobbying work that your state bar um, association has done. And likewise, the ABA works in its area of lobbying um, in order to make sure that we are pushing issues of importance uh, two attorneys across this country. And again, um, a Maryland attorney, Kevin Shepard, um, who has been at the front lines for the ABA on our gatekeeper regulation task force, addressing beneficial ownership issues that are so important to attorneys. And Kevin serves on the board of governors, as you may know now, <clears throat> and in a month he will become the ABA treasurer. So we're all very proud of that as well. The ABA continues to advocate for lawyers just as we did when Baltimore's Mike McWilliams served as ABA president many years ago. Um, we recently worked with federal agencies to improve customs and border searches and their policies to better protect privileged client information on attorney electronic devices during border crossings, excuse me. <clears throat> we defeated mandatory accrual accounting proposals in Congress that would have required law firms to pay taxes on income long before the income is received from clients. And we help state bars advocate most recently with officials who crafted shelter in place orders to include within the definition of essential services, critical legal services, which cannot be delivered legally or practically remotely. We noted that, for example, in many states required in-person execution of instruments such as wills and powers of attorney and criminal defense counsel were needed in order to access uh, incarcerated clients to provide confidential legal advice and to protect important constitutional rights. We are meeting at a momentous time, a historic chapter for our bar associations, for our profession, and for our nation. And for one thing, we're refining and redefining new ways of how we interact with and learn from one another. Our members know that they can always turn to our bar associations for professional development, the latest information in their practice areas, national networks, opportunities to teach and publish and lead and so much more. Our need to meet virtually doesn't change our essential role one bit. In fact, it's already led as you've heard from your team to expanded audiences, more convenient participation for many attorneys and reduced costs for members. The resilience we offer in our practices along with the dedication and creativity of our government agency and public interest legal aid attorneys, our bar associations and our courts are enabling us as a profession to adapt and overcome the challenges brought on by the pandemic. And we will continue to evolve. At the ABA, our unique vantage across all practices and settings <clears throat> against the backdrop of the great laboratory of experience throughout our 50 states provides a valuable perspective on what is essential for lawyers during the pandemic and beyond to be productive and financially viable, perform quality legal work with the highest ethical standards and strengthen our relationship with our clients. That is the drive behind the ABA's new coordinating group on Practice Forward. 
Practice Forward is gathering pandemic responsive resources from across the ABA and harnessing expertise to address emerging legal practice needs by all attorneys in all practice settings. The group will also collect input from state and local and affinity bar associations across the country. Our work on Practice Forward complements our ongoing work through the ABA's Pandemic Task Force, which since March has met weekly to share information and make connections among national legal aid providers, federal and state court leaders, pro bono organizations, pro se advocates, and others, as we grapple with how to meet the arising needs out of those who are coming from the pan out of the pandemic, and most importantly, the most vulnerable of populations that have been impacted. The pandemic, of course, is only one major change faced by our profession and the clients and public we serve. We also, at this time, meet at the crossroads of history when it comes to justice in America. And we are experiencing a long overdue awakening to a truth about the prevalent and persistent racism in our justice system and greater civil society. We will realize solutions only with the realship of not only the organized bar, but with the contributions of each of you, each of you as individual lawyer citizens and statespersons. It's important to remind ourselves of systemic injustices again and again, not only today, not only this week, not only this year. As lawyers, we have a special responsibility an enduring responsibility to stand up against injustice, especially injustice caused by laws that are racist and unjust in deed or effect. Our black colleagues and neighbors have endured too much. Black lives matter and we must stand up together for the rule of law for everyone. I hear so many ABA members and others and lawyers and judges who are expressing words of support and thoughtful suggestions and offers to help. And I know similar voices are being heard by other bar associations. Chief, Just Chief Judge Barbara's statement on equal justice under law, along with her formation, on the state judici formation of the State Judiciary Committee on Equal Justice will tremendously help mobilize the profession and your leaders around the many issues and discussions, policy development and projects and other critical tasks at hand. At the ABA, we are working across a multitude of fronts to further advance our just racial justice efforts. We have stood up a new racial equity website that has numerous resources for members, the great legal, greater legal profession and the public. Building on decades long, highly regarded standards work in the criminal justice arena in civil rights advocacy, we're advancing policies on police accountability, urging objectively reasonable standards for a defense of excessive force, a national database on, pol on police disciplinary records, no chokeholds, and more for consideration by our fast approaching House of Delegates in August. And we must continue to take a hard look at our profession and what more we can do. We have long struggled to diversify the legal profession with limited success and numbers well below not only expectations, but what any of us would envision as success. The public whom we are committed to serve and help benefits from the richness and in intellect and talent and dedication that only a diverse and inclusive legal profession can deliver both within and outside the courtroom. We are today announcing a three-part weekly town hall series the first of which on July 7th, we'll, and we're hosting it with a group of co-sponsors. And it, the first one will feature the three black former presidents of the American Bar Association. And then the, the series will, consider, will continue weekly. And we are committed to a diverse and inclusive profession, not only when it comes to race and ethnicity, and we have had the wonderful champions from Maryland in that regard, Bob Gonzalez and, and others over the years, but also sexual orientation and gender identity and disability status. And we're committing to helping our law graduates and law students as they go through the process of the bar exam and continue their studies during the pandemic. And we are most grateful for leaders like Chris Jennison and others in the Young Lawyers Division who are helping not only young lawyers, but others 
understand the importance of wellness and well being and health for themselves and for those whom they serve. This year, like your meeting, is virtual, as will be the ABA's annual meeting for the first time ever, July 29th to August 4th. We'll also be making history by offering the meeting programming for no registration to our members, no registration fee to our members. And the theme this year, a theme we don't usually have at all, but the theme we've placed on this year's meeting very early in the year was convening for justice. And it'll focus on addressing in-depth issues of injustice and inequities, including those exacerbated by the pandemic. So I hope you can enjoy, join us for what I know will be an informative meeting. The ABA relies on the support and involvement of our members. We look to members just like your bar association to serve as speakers and authors and advocates and leaders who promote professional excellence and fortify our system of justice. For those of you who are loyal ABA members, I thank you. And for those of you who understand that that membership complements your membership in your Maryland bar, I hope you appreciate what you get out of both organizations. And I ask other of those to join us as you do your work in the Maryland Bar Association so that we can be the voice of the legal profession, a voice for excellence for lawyers and a voice for equal justice for all. So again, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I am honored to represent the American legal profession with you at my side. And thank you for committing yourselves, each of you, to be the best lawyers and the best leaders you can be for all those whom we serve. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, President Martinez. And thank you for those inspirational words. We're, we're, I'm, I, I'm really glad that our members have an opportunity to hear some of the behaviors, some of the actions that the ABA is, is, is taking to face uh, not only professional issues, but also issues of the public and the public interest. So thank you so much and it's very appreciated. Uh, now, I call on, uh, we are going to have a report concerning the Bar Association Insurance Trust. Mr. President, uh, Chief Judge Barbera, colleagues, uh, my name is Phil Nichols and I'm pleased to present the report of the Bar Association's Insurance Trust this morning. The trust was created by the State Bar and the Baltimore City Bar to provide insurance products to the membership. In addition, we have a special marketing relationship with the Montgomery County Bar Association. We are expanding our work and highlighting our efforts <clears throat> under the Bar Association's insurance agency in concert with our exclusive coordinating brokers at Tribridge Partners. Here's what we'll be going forward with this year. Please support our efforts to provide our members with good quality insurance and benefits advice, discounted programs, and non-dues revenue to the State Bar and the Baltimore City Bar Association. If you're looking at insurance options, please look to the Bar Agency. I need uh, first to thank uh, Aaron Kadish, our leader for decades. Many of you, like Steve Platt and Glenn Harrell, actually went to the Saturday morning meeting just to hear the good news that Aaron brought to the meeting and to see his suspenders. I'd hope to have the suspenders for this meeting, but just not able to pull out all together. Perhaps next year we'll work on the suspenders or braces. The trust um, is composed of six trustees, six appointed from the state bar, six from the Baltimore City Bar. Those trustees are Tom Waxter, T. Wax, our vice chair, Mary Ellen Flynn, our secretary, who's helping me, John W. Beckley, our treasurer, Judge Michael W. Reed, Bob Ann Binder, Joe Benson Fogel, Judge Dana Middleton, Thomas D. Murphy, Timothy P. O'Brien, Marshall B. Paul, Fabian D. Walters, Jr. Um, in addition to the trustees, we have appointed an executive committee to make recommendations and to meet during those periods of time in between the trustees meeting. The executive committee is composed of the officers, that is uh, T. Wax, uh, Mary Ellen Flynn, John Beckley, Judge Michael W. Reed, Joe Benson Fogel, and Tom Murphy. They are committee chairs, and uh, Tom, as you know, is a former past president of the State Bar Association. Um, the good news, the actually really good news part of this report is the fact that through the years we have contributed some $1,810,063 to, to the Bar Associations uh, that support us and make possible what we do. 
Our objectives for the coming year is to make the trust work for its members and enhance all our benefits and, and provide a greater opportunity for awareness of these offerings within our, our legal community. Uh, we try to deliver an exclusive value to members uh, uh, similar to what happened with the CPAs of America. Their, their membership benefit by way of insurance is, is really very, very good. And in fact, that's our aspirational goal to catch up with the CPAs of this world and providing this insurance benefit to our members. Um, some of our current products, um, we, we've led the way with life insurance. As one of my friends once said, if you have a life insurance company, everybody's on your side. Well, there's a lot of truth to that, and our life insurance has been, um, been a, a, good, a good part of our programs. We've looked at uh, professional liability. They're, they're all there. Uh, the judiciary defense policy through Mason and Carter, um, our group disability insurance with Massachusetts Mutual. Um, we're looking at pet insurance. There are lots of uh, options for us and directions to go in, and that is, in fact, uh, where we're going. We have called this the reboot, and as part of that reboot, we're going to take a 12-month look at our marketing calendar and how we direct um, uh, information and how we take care of those inquiries that come from providing that information. We're going to do a monthly electronic newsletter this year. We're going to use uh, direct mail opportunities and all of this with the intent to providing better information, better products, and enhancing our operational goal of making uh, insurance products better for the bar and better for the members. And that frankly is it. The reboot is something we've all looked at carefully. We think that's a good opportunity. Um, our partners at TriBridge have led the way. Um, and that is in fact where we are. I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any. I know we're somewhat limited for the time. Well, thank you, uh, Judge Phillips. Um, right now, the next order of business is the amendments to the MSBA bylaws. Can everybody hear me? Um, last month, the, uh, I think it was May 15th, the Maryland State Bar Association Board of Governors unanimously approved the bylaw committee's motion to amend the MSBA bylaws and to forward those amended bylaws with a recommendation to the Board of Governors by the Board of Governors to the membership that those bylaws be approved. A notice regarding the proposed bylaw amendments was circulated to all members on Thursday, May 28, 2020. Per, per the MSBA bylaws, that motion is before the membership at this meeting. Accordingly, the chair recognizes the co-chairs of the bylaws committee, Marshall Paul and Bill Carlson, to explain the background, the summary of changes proposed and the rationale for the motion to amend the MSB, MSBA bylaws to be considered. So right now I would uh, turn that over to our bylaw committee chairs. Okay, thank you um, very much, President Williams. Uh, it's an honor to be able to speak to the entire membership about the bylaws. Um, I think most people know the history of the bylaws committee. We were originally constituted in uh, 2017 by President Arthur to review the bylaws, which hadn't been visited in approximately 30 years. We, um, our initial task was to, um, to, to examine inconsistencies in the bylaws and language that really was ambiguous, just generally wasn't clear. Um, so our, our initial role was really very limited. Um, the amendments we recommended were approved at the um, MSBA's annual meeting in uh, 2018. Um, the next year, uh, President Trufer asked us to do a deeper dive with respect to the bylaws and take a look at the uh, MSBA's policies and procedures to uh, determine how they were integrated with the bylaws and to make sure that there weren't a lot of inconsistencies and to try to reconcile those inconsistencies where we we found them. So we went through the bylaws again. We made um, other recommendations to the Board of Governors. Those recommendations were made um, actually very late in, in 2019. They were approved by the Board of Governors, but they weren't approved in, in time to submit those uh, recommendations to the membership at uh, last summer's annual meeting. 
So those recommendations were presented for consideration at the um, mid-year meeting uh, this past winter. Um, we received um, feedback um, with certain uh, changes that were uh, additional changes that were requested. Um, President Williams appointed um, two section chairs uh, to our committee. Um, that included the chair of the estate section and the chair of the, um, the solo and small firm section to provide additional input with regard to the bylaws. Uh, the bylaws committee had a uh, uh, had a, uh, an extensive discussion concerning additional changes. Um, we've made changes that the um, those additional uh, those two additional um, uh, members of our committee have have approved, and we've incorporated those changes in what we're submitting to you today. Um, I can go through those, uh, uh, Dana, if you'd like me to. It's up. It, it's entirely up to you. You want to move to the next slide? I, I guess I can do that. Okay, so um, go ahead. One more slide. slide. Next slide. So um, basically, what we did was we added four provisions, which uh, um, have been signed off on by, both by those those new committee members and by the board of governors. Um, first of all, we clarified the agenda for um, annual meetings and special meetings of the members would be provided to members with notice of those meetings. Um, we also restored the original um, uh, proxy language in the, um, in the bylaws, which provided that uh, proxies had to be submitted 48 hours um, ahead of the meeting. We provided for a uh, period for notice and comment with regard to policy changes that were going to be made by the Board of Governors so that um, if the Board of Governors um, elected to make changes to its policies and rules and regulations um, before adopting those suggested um, changes, the Board of Governors would give notice to the members and an opportunity to comment. Um, and in addition, we provided that there would be uh, two of the section governors on any future policy committee. Right now we have, I think, three section governors who are appointed by the sections. Um, those governors rotate um, uh, from year to year. And at the request of the estate section and the uh, small uh, firm solo section, um, two of the section governors would always be on the policy committee. And finally, um, in the course of, of um, amending, proposing amendments to the bylaws, the committee had moved a section of the bylaws that dealt with the authority of sections to take positions on legislation from the bylaws themselves and had moved that, sec those, that provision to the, policy, to the MSBA's policy. And we also made another uh, slight change. Um, at the request of those sections, and I think it's a, it's a, a good change, we have moved that provision from the MSBA's policies back to the bylaws. And I think that's that's it. I, the next, I don't think there is a next slide, is there, Dana? No, nope, that's it. So those are the additional changes that have been made since um, last summer. And we're asking the members, um, ha those changes having been approved by the Board of Governors, we're asking that the, the membership now approve um, the, the bylaws as, as they're proposed to be amended. Thank you, Marshall. Bill Carlson, do you have any additional comments? Is Bill with us? Charlie, I think uh, you have some comments at this moment. Thank you, President Williams. Where do you want to wait? I, we could just wait a moment. Uh, we'll see if anyone has written in to the chat okay. for any well, objections. Now, now is uh, 
Now is the opportunity per, per the MSBA bylaws and standing rules for members who wish to discuss the proposed amendment bylaws that have been placed before you uh, at the unanimous uh, motion of the Board of Governors. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, uh, speak or speak about the proposed amended bylaws, now is the time to speak. If you like to have, com if you have comments, please go to the chat. If there are no comments at this time, then um, now is the time at the conclusion of the debate. The question is on the adoption of the motion by the Board of Governors, unanimously approved by the Board of Governors for the amended bylaws. If there is no objection, the amended bylaws will be approved as proposed. If you wish to file an objection, you should type that into the chat room. No objections having been received. Um, the motion is approved as proposed and the bylaws are passed. Uh, that moving on to the next uh, item of business. And that is the, uh, I would ask the assembled group to join in a moment of silence as the MSBA presents the names of friends and colleagues of the MSBA who have passed away this year. Thank you everyone. There are many friends and, and colleagues that have unfortunately left us in the past year. Uh, next on the agenda, I believe we are going to queue up, uh, as many of you may know, the MSBA has 30 sections of specialized communities that seek to provide programs and content based on practice areas or affinity groups, such as young lawyers, business law, and our solo and small firm section. I want to take a moment to introduce the elected leaders of each of those sections for the coming bar year.
those are the faces of your uh, of your uh, bar leaders and your section leaders. So please remember them and refer to them if you need to. I also have been reminded that uh, Judge Vincent Vermeer recently passed away on Sunday morning and that uh, he is part of our thoughts and the thoughts of the MSBA also. Um, the chair now recognizes the Honorable Mary Ellen Barbera, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals of Maryland. And then immediately thereafter, the Honorable John Morrissey, Chief Judge of the District Court of Maryland for the remarks on the state of the judiciary. Judge Barbera, I turn it over to you. All right, I hope you can hear me now. I can I hear you now, Judge. Okay, perfect. Good evening, President Williams, President-elect Skirty, distinguished members of the Board of Governors and the attorneys who are the Maryland State Bar Association. I hope that you're all doing well and are safe as we meet in an historically novel manner. Let me take a moment to acknowledge the hard work of President Williams in a year like few, if any, others. President Williams, you, together with the leadership and membership of the MSBA, have remained absolutely undaunted by the many challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. I could go on, but in the interest of time, I would not. Um, I have a long list of uh, the many reasons why I so admire President Williams. I have equal admiration for President-elect Skirty. Um, we go way back. Uh, he is well prepared, and I'm sure you know this yourselves, to take up the mantle of leadership to meet the challenges of the upcoming year. Thank you both, and thank you, members of the MSBA, for your dedication to the legal profession and the community we're all so proud to serve. Thank you as well for asking me to speak again this year on the state of Maryland's judiciary. The manner of this meeting is a reflection of the unprecedented and challenging times we are facing. I believe you are all aware as we, the judiciary has worked hard to keep the Maryland State Bar and the public we serve aware that we have, the judiciary has been able to carry out the core functions of its mandate throughout the COVID-19 emergency. The organized, effective, and swift response by the Maryland judiciary would not have been possible without a wonderful team of talented leaders and equally committed personnel. They have worked many, many long hours, including nights and weekends, to help steer the judiciary through this emergency, and they will continue to do so. We are closing in, as many of you know, perhaps all of you know, we, we are closing in on the end of phase two of our return to full operations. As we approach the beginning of phase three, clerk's offices are preparing to reopen to the public for routine business. The courts will hear additional matters, including some matters that are contested. Meanwhile, we will keep monitoring health trends and keep everyone apprised of any changes that may be necessary to the scheduling of the planned five phases of the judiciary's phased return to full function. On March 12, 2020, we issued the first two COVID-19 related orders restricting non-essential judicial activities and suspending jury trials, which can, as you know, require up to several hundred potential jurors entering a courthouse. The next day, we issued another order closing the courts to the public, except for emergency proceedings. As the pandemic has progressed, administrative orders have been issued to guide the response of the judiciary. Those orders, like every emergency order that may need to be issued, have taken into account the actions of the governor, as well as the advice of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Maryland Department of Health. All of the orders have been vetted internally to be certain that they have reflected the on the ground capacity and needs of the trial and appellate courts. Those orders have allowed the courts to perform essential functions while adhering to the mandates of due process and of course, the rule of law. 
Subsequent orders told statutes of limitations and other filing deadlines to initiate matters, revisited and extended the suspension of grand juries and jury trials, as I mentioned, and addressed the enforcement of residential foreclosure and eviction orders. Other orders provided guidance to the trial courts on detained juveniles and incarcerated adults. Also included is an administrative order authorizing the expanded use of remote technology for court proceedings. A word about the use of remote technology. We have learned, we in the judiciary have learned the value of remote proceedings and we plan to apply those lessons to future practices and procedures. The Court of Appeals has approved amended rules of procedure that will make an expansion of remote proceedings param, uh, excuse me, permanent in civil matters beginning July 1, 2020. We have leveraged MDEC to allow electronic filings to the Court of Special Appeals and the Court of Appeals in the three counties that are not yet part of the system. We have seen plea agreements, sentencings, bail reviews, and uncontested divorces conducted successfully on a remote basis. Some mediations are proceeding remotely. We are especially excited that judges are holding drug and mental health court dockets using remote technology to maintain the continuity the participants need, they absolutely need to succeed. Communication has been essential during the emergency. The judiciary has been in ongoing communication with the Maryland Department of Health and the Departments of Juvenile Services, Public Safety and Correctional Services, as well as General Services. We have also had discussions with the Governor's Legal Counsel and the Office of the Attorney General to address issues and coordinate efforts. On a local level, um, many of you may be aware, administrative judges are working with our justice partners, that would be you and others, to expand technology to permit and expedite remote hearings. We also have been in continuing communication with you the Maryland State Bar Association, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to have that uh, very important, I would say, back and forth um, conversation to the State Bar Association and to other state and local bar associations. We, we thank you for that opportunity to exchange information. Judicial leaders on a local level have been attending town hall meetings with their local bar associations and perhaps more than a few of you have participated in those. Judiciary work groups in both the district court and the circuit courts convened and identified best practices and strategies for the safe reopening by phasing in court functions. I, as you can imagine, it was no small task to work through what needed to be done when, if at all possible, uh, given the the health related issues that we must be constantly aware of. The resulting plans were merged into an emergency administrative orders, actually a series of those that issued in early June. In all phases, my friends, safety measures are required, including masks and social distancing for both court visitors and personnel until the CDC and the Maryland Department of Health confirm that they are no longer needed. Assuming Maryland continues to move forward, the judiciary will move to phase three on July 20th of this year. On that day, we plan to reopen the clerk's offices in the district court and the circuit courts to the public and expand the types of matters that will be heard, including contested trials in the district court. With the same assumption as to the status of COVID-19 in Maryland, the judiciary will move to phase four on August 31st of this year. On that day, we plan to resume non-jury trials and other contested matters in the circuit courts and the district court. We hope to be able to move to phase five on October 5th, resuming jury trials, the final aspect that completes the judiciary's full operations. Chief Judge Morrissey, will, who will follow immediately upon the conclusion of my remarks, will speak more about the phased resumption of operations in the district court. When I refer to the resumption of routine operations, I must be clear that we are engaged in ongoing examination of how best we must fulfill our mandate of how we best conduct the business of the Maryland judiciary. 
The world as we all knew it in March is no more, not quite ever to be like it once was, but am amazing positives will um, uh, emerge as a result of this, I have no doubt. We have become accustomed to wearing masks, keeping social distance, an oxymoron if ever there was one, and using remote technology. We have begun and will continue to address the backlogs of matters that must be heard and decided for the people of Maryland. We have begun cautiously to forge ahead. At the same time, we face an equally important challenge. And I, my thanks to President Martinez for uh, speaking to Maryland's involvement in facing this important challenge. We must acknowledge as you know, and face the injustices of unaddressed racial bias and discrimination that long have festered and undermined our promise of equal justice for all. We are confronting now the work that has cried to be done, work that can wait no longer. The world as we knew it in March has changed and again necessarily must change for the better. As Chief Judge, I am responsible for the administration of the judiciary. As such, like other chief justices throughout our nation, I have issued a statement, which I hope some, I hope many um, have, have read on equal justice under law, affirming our commitment to the oaths we have sworn, you and I, and our duty to keep the promise of equal justice under law for everyone. I have also directed the creation, as you heard earlier, of a new standing committee of the Judicial Council, the Committee on Equal Justice. I have appointed more than 40 members from throughout the judiciary, including the Honorable E. Gregory Wells of the Court of Special Appeals, who will chair that vital, very important committee. The Committee on Equal Justice has been empowered to take a hard look, both within and without, and to identify where we, the Maryland judiciary, must improve and where we must change. These will be hard conversations, but they are conversations that are overdue. We also have the honor to lead the judiciary, those of us who lead the judiciary, um, to listen and to take on the work that must be done. The Committee on Equal Justice will begin its work in early July, remotely, of course, and we will be relying on you Please, all of you, members of the MSBA, Delegate Barron, I see you, your, your photograph here uh, this afternoon. Good to see you again and many, many others. We will be relying on you, the MSBA, and your individual members to be part of work groups that will expedite and refine our work. It is important. It is not a task that the judiciary can do alone. Together, you and I and the Maryland judiciary we will do the work that is needed, as must we all, in all of our other walks of life. We must do so even as we navigate the difficult challenges of steering the judiciary through the COVID-19 emergency. Thank you, thank you for your work as lawyers to make the emergency operations possible and for the work you will do over the months to come. We will need you to be part of the conversations that must be had conversations that likely already are going on in your communities. I certainly hope they are. We have the sworn duty, my fellow members of the bar, to uphold the constitutions of our state and of our nation and to keep the promise of equality under law. We have a, the momentous honor, indeed it is an honor to do so. It is our special duty to ensure that in every courthouse, courtroom and office, Maryland lives up to the promise of equal justice every day. So there will be no business as usual for the Maryland judiciary. Our practices necessarily will change. We will safeguard as much as we reasonably can, the health of the public, judiciary personnel, and you, our justice partners. We are leveraging technology, incorporating social distancing, restructuring dockets and rethinking current business practices as we return to full functionality. And we will learn how to be better. We will keep the promise that has for too long been denied, whether by process 
or bias, implicit or not. You will notice that I speak of we, together, you and I, we have helped to preserve the rule of law and meet the, net, meet the net, um, needs of the people of Maryland during this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you for that we could not, none of us can do it alone. We all have much work to do in the months and years ahead. We have a long way to go before we see the end of this pandemic and an equally hard road to achieve equal justice under law for all in Maryland. But Mr. President, Mr. President-elect, members of the Board of Governors, members of the Maryland State Bar Association, I am certain that we will get through this together. We will do it for the people of Maryland, for a better Maryland for all. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, um, um, President Williams. Thank you, Chief Judge Barbera. Those are great words and they are taken to heart by the Maryland State Bar Association and all its members. Thank you. I now recognize Chief Judge uh, John Morrissey, Chief Judge of the District Court of Maryland. Thank you, Dana. Um, before I begin my remarks, I, I, I'm not sure if this was a coincidence or not, but I, I got my Maryland State <laughs> Bar invoice today in the mail, and I promise you that I will I will pay that this evening before I leave the office. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this new digital version of the Maryland State Bar Association annual meeting. If this were normal times, I would have already worked over the buffet line and I'd be getting ready to put on shorts and flip flops. But as we all know, unfortunately, these are not even close to normal times. These are exceptional times that have required unprecedented actions necessary to balance the safety of attorneys, judges, staff, other justice partners, and, um, and the public that we serve with the need to continue operations to ensure that due process and the rule of law are safeguarded. In the matter of a day, the district court pivoted from conducting in-court proceedings with all persons and parties present in a courtroom to proceedings held largely remotely by telephone and video. And just as the district court pivoted in one day, I've witnessed President Williams pivot the Bar Association to focusing on coordination and communication with the judiciary while sustaining efforts representing and supporting the very members of this very association. I congratulate you, President Williams, on a job well done. I can only imagine the sense of relief you must be feeling on passing the responsibility to Judge Skirty. I can guess that you're counting the minutes before you can also change into board shorts and flip-flops and go back to working as a regular lawyer, simply trying to figure out how to practice law in the midst of an ongoing pandemic. As a private practitioner for 17 years before becoming a judge, I can remember the day-to-day -day stress, billable hours, deadlines, hoping to get paid on time, but I can only imagine the exponential stress that all attorneys are under as the result of this pandemic. The district court is mindful of the requirement to address your needs and the needs of your clients. And we're itching to get back to work. And no, I don't believe that itching is a COVID symptom, but we must do so safely for your sake, for the sake of your clients, my judges and staff and the public. As a result, going back to work will necessarily not look the same. While the current courts are currently in phase two, as Chief Judge Barbera mentioned of the five phase reopening plan and will remain so for a few more weeks, we're charging ahead with the other phases. As the courts move into phase three, the district court clerk's offices will open to the public, criminal trials will begin, rent escrow actions will be set in, and domestic violence and peace order hearings will shift away from the commissioners and back to judges during court hours. In phase four, courts expect to begin handling civil matters, failure to pay rent cases, and minor traffic, and by phase five, we hope that everyone will be back up and running with a full complement of case types, including toll violations. But even in phase five, back up and running isn't going to mean things are back to normal. Throughout all phases, some things may be held remotely, some in person, some both. Although we're a state system and we strive for uniformity, in this instance, how the clerks and judges can handle work during this pandemic may be different from location to location. However, across the state, we are ensuring the safety protocols are in place everywhere. You must answer a series of questions regarding your health before you enter the courthouse. We're asking that you and your clients wear masks 
or face coverings at all times unless addressing the court and where available, which should be everywhere, our bailiffs have been issued no touch temperature sensors to screen all courthouse visitors. We will practice and enforce physical distancing in every location. I ask you to please check our web pages. Each courthouse now has its own web page for docket information and other local protocols and phased reopening information. We also ask you to be patient with us and give us your constructive suggestions. When I became chief judge on June 1st, 2014, I was faced with immediately implementing the appointed attorney program. And thank you to all those appointed attorneys who continue to provide excellent service during this pandemic. And I had one month to roll out the appointed attorney program. I needed a rule change, so I asked Judge Wilner of the Rules Committee if I could present at the upcoming Rules Committee meeting. He introduced me to the committee by likening me to an individual that had enlisted in the Navy in Hawaii on December 6th, 1941. In congratulating Judge Skirty on his rise to the presidency of the MSBA, I told him this story and I'm assuming that he feels the same now as I did then. Well, I cannot say that implementing the appointed attorney program or guiding the MSBA is quite like, like Pearl Harbor. I do believe Judge Skirty's turn as president will be a challenge unlike any that has come before. I'm incredibly proud of Mark and his efforts for the district court have been nothing short of impressive. R.J. Plasio, the author of the children's book and movie Wonder, wrote Courage, Kindness, Friendship, Character. These are the qualities that define us as human beings and propel us on occasion to greatness. When I read these words, I could not help think of Mark as he possesses all of these qualities. It's why over the years I've leaned on him for duties outside of his judgeship, and it's why I'm confident that it is, it is in his nature to never fail to rise to the challenge in front of him. Mark, congratulations again. President Williams, congratulations on your ten tenure. Thank you to all that are part of the Maryland State Bar Association. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Morris. I just want to make a comment, and that is that uh, by virtue of the fact that when COVID came to be, uh, we reached out to the to the judiciary. They responded. And I can assure you, although most of it goes on behind closed doors, they have worked very diligently and very, very hard to deal with an, an unprecedented situation. This was not, nothing was done by accident here and it, they really put an effort through and I think it really shows up. And as on behalf of the MSBA, I thank all of you. I thank the entire uh, judiciary. So thank you so much. Now, uh, the chair now presents the report of the Board of Governors acting as the nominating committee. Uh, the way, whether you know this or not, the way it works is the, 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 the Board of Governors in December accepts nominations for uh, people who would like to be part of the leadership of the, or the, not the, the officers of the corporation, I mean, of the organization. And that was done again this year. So, the recommendation of the Board of Governors acting as a nominating committee is for Secretary, Delegate Eric Barron, for Treasurer Jason uh, Deloach, and uh, Natalie McNary as the, Natalie McSherry as the President-elect. By virtue of the fact of being the President-elect for the last year, Mark Skirty is automatically the President of this uh, wonderful organization. So uh, that being said, I would suggest that uh, now it's time to make an election. Uh, and if there are no objections to the slate of officers named to serve in their respective positions, those names will be elected. Do we have any objections to the officers that have been nominated by the Board of Governors? If you have objections, note them in the chat room. Hearing no objection or seeing no objection, Delegate Eric Barron has been elected as treasurer. Jason Deloach has been, I mean, as secretary. Jason Deloach has been elected as treasurer and Natalie McSherry is the president elect. And so congratulations to all of you. The chair now welcomes the Honorable Mary Ellen Barbera to administer the oath of office and to ask the newly, elect, newly elected officers, including Natalie, as president-elect to please rise.
This is when we see the Bermuda shorts. Judge, we cannot hear you, you're on mute. I'll try it once again. Didn't hear me the first time through when I was uh, muted, no? Okay, uh, I'm going to ask each of you and that will be the oath of office for Maryland state officers and with your um, permission, Dan, um, President Williams, uh, would you want the Board of Governors, the new members of the Board of Governors also to be taking their oath at this time or separately? Uh, they can take it at the same time, yes. Okay, very good. So, so this I'm is back. to the elected officers and the, board, the new Board of Governors. Yes, Mr. President, yes, okay. Um, so I would ask each of you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, say Hi. your name. Hi, Jason Deloach. Uh, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, swear, swear that I will support and implement the bylaws of the Maryland State Bar. I will try it again. That I will support and implement the bylaws of the Maryland State Bar. That I will, that I will support, support and implement the bylaws of the Maryland State Bar. State Bar. And to the best of my ability. And to, and to the best of my ability. Carry out the obligations imposed by the Code of Professional Responsibility. Carry, carry out, out the carry obligations out the of the Code of Professional Responsibility. Well done. That I will. That I will. That I will. That I will. In fulfilling the responsibilities of my office. In fulfilling the responsibilities of my office. Maintain the highest standards of service to the bar. Maintain, maintain the, the highest standards of service to the bar. The bench. The bench. The bench. The bench. And the public. And, and, and the, the public. public. All right, uh, you are duly sworn. I am pleased to declare you the duly elected and installed officers and board of the Maryland State Bar Association, Board of Governors rather with all of the rights, privileges, duties and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Congratulations to each and every one of you and thank you for your service. Thank you. Congratulations to all and thank you for your service. Thank you, Judge Barbera. My pleasure. Uh, moving on, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege for a minute, Mr. President-elect. On the well, actually, you're now president, Mark. I have um, here. I don't know if you can see it. This is a hat that I have worn hundreds of times uh, during my course of years president. It's been seen everywhere. It's dog-eared. It's stained. It's worn out. It's kind of like the the about the immediate past president is. So I, I sent something over to you and I asked you to lead, to pick it up from the box. I'm not asking you to put it on right now because I don't want to mess your hair up or anything, <laughs> but um, go ahead and pick it up and take a look at it because you will note there's something more specific about that hat. I say it says president. <laughs> you cannot hide. You are identified for everyone to see. So, uh, thank you, Dana. <laughs> and I have procured one that says past president. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So Mark, you have my heartiest congratulations and I welcome you to the floor. And I am now retired. Well, thank you. Chief Judge Barbera, Chief Judge Morrissey, thank you both for your very kind words and your support. You both have been the voice of the judiciary through very difficult times. You have empowered each of us on the judiciary to develop creative solutions during this pandemic, pandemic and to provide access to justice for Marylanders across the state and helping to reopen our courts safely. You've set the example of true leadership. I also wanna thank Dana Williams for being such a great mentor and friend. Dana, you will now be known as you've got on your hat, past president. You've maintained calm when calm was needed. Your thoughtful approach and solutions to the challenges that we faced this past year were instrumental in keeping lawyers and judges informed, educated, and engaged. Your leadership is truly to be celebrated. I personally wanna thank you also for your guidance and your advice and keeping me involved throughout your year. You consistently said to me, we're a partnership and you actually meant it. You rose to the occasion 
as many curves were thrown your way. Let's see, COVID, murder bees, and ending your term with the Saharan desert, desert dust storm. Quite memorable. Yet through it all, you were able to adapt quickly to help protect the association from the financial impact that we faced and make the very difficult decisions for the safety of our membership. Thank you, Dana. I only hope to effectively carry over with me your teachings and your leadership into my year. Sandy, we are delivering your husband back to you. Thanks for your continual support. And I know I can call on you for your perspective from time to time this year. Vic, I wanna thank you for your vision, your forward vision, and your, also your leadership. I was the incoming treasurer when you came on board fresh out of DC full of ideas and enthusiasm. Well, a few bumps and bruises later, you took over an organization and prepared us for the next chapter. If we were ready for change and well, you gave it to us. I look forward to our honest discussions, the hard decisions that we have to make as we continue to build the MSBA into one of the, if not the leading voluntary bar across this country. I look forward to working with Anna and Doris and all of our staff who have gone above and beyond and risen to the challenges this past year. Their dedication to our profession is to be celebrated. This year, my focus will be on diversity and inclusion as well as access to justice. They overlap each other in many ways, more so now than ever. We need to engage in dialogue, to listen, learn, and lead the way for change and reforms within our legal system. And the MSBA is not immune or exempt from those reforms. And instead, we must be a leader. If not us, then who? This coming year, I'm kicking off a new process for the governance selection. All committee and task force chairs and members are gonna be vetted through a process to ensure that they reflect our membership whether age, gender, geographic location, disability type, type of practice, race, we are striving to achieve the best balance of participation. Gone are the days when the president is given that daunting task of choosing our committees and the task force alone. Now we have a committee to aid in this selection process to help us achieve our goals of diversity and inclusion. We will strive to accommodate everyone who's expressed an interest through our online portal system. To that end, if you want to be involved, please email me or Anna directly. I am honored to serve as the MSBA representative on Attorney General Frost's COVID-19 Access to Justice Task Force to be part of the solution as we reopen Maryland's courts. We as lawyers and stewards of the law of our rights need to stand up and speak out against injustice and exclusion. We should continue to celebrate the strides that we have made, defend the good that we do, but also speak out about the wrongs within our legal system so that we can be a part of that solution. As part of the solution, I will be continuing the Emerging Issues Task Force that was initiated under past President Williams' year. This task force will be charged with responding to the issues that arose, that arise throughout the year and be the voice of our association, where an individual's voice may get lost or in the case of judges, unable to respond. We will continue to educate our members of the legislature about the longstanding policy of supporting the sitting judges who have all been vetted and appointed by a governor. We will help the citizens understand our legal system and protect the independence of the judiciary. This year, I will be kicking off a task force to focus on addressing issues specific to our paralegals and our profession, increasing the content that we make available to them and adding more value to increase the paralegal membership in our association a task force to address our out-of-state attorneys and other jurisdictions, making sure that our CLE and other content remains relevant. An existing task force will continue 
to work on facilitating the group health insurance for our members. Another new task force will be to give new direction to our professionalism committee by adding content, webinars, and podcasts to enhance civility in a virtual world. And another new initiative will be a task force to address cybersecurity and threats. This area is of great concern to many as we saw what happened in the city of Baltimore with the ransomware attack. I judge you appear to be frozen in the MSBA so that they may benefit from our programs, our CLEs, network. President Skirty, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you could just go back about 20 seconds, you froze for the audience. If you could just go right back and would love to have those comments. Thank you. So I'll, I'll pick up again. I'm sorry. Uh, existing task force will continue on working on facilitating the group health insurance to our members, a new task force to give new direction to our professionalism committee by adding content, webinars to enhance the civility in a virtual world. Another new task initiative will be to add a task force to address cyber security and threats. This area is of great concern to many as we saw what happened to the city of Baltimore Judge, you're frozen again. Targets. Turning to membership, we've initiated the I'm All In at 100% campaign. We're challenging law firms, both private and public, to provide 100% membership of their attorneys in the MSBA so that all may benefit from our programs, the CLEs, the networking, referrals, lawyer assistance, and publications. We need you more than ever to renew our mem your membership so that we can continue to represent. Voluntary bar dues in the country. Please spread the news about your MSBA and encourage attorneys, judges, and paralegals that you know to join so that they can see the tremendous value. I'd love to see every firm pledge to be um, all in at 100% and show your support to the MSBA. To my judge friends, listen up, especially if you are not a member of the MSBA, I hope you will consider joining or rejoining. Your presence is invaluable, in particular to those young lawyers of our association. They enjoy the opportunity to meet and talk to judges at events and CLEs Many connections have resulted with resulting in internships and other employment opportunities. We as judges should be giving back to our profession and what better way than through the MSBA. When I talk to young attorneys across the state, they've all expressed to me their wish that more judges were present at these events. Vic, you mentioned, or we talked briefly about the Legal Excellence Week. The Legal Excellence Week will take place November 9th to the 13th. We'll be monitoring COVID and make sure that it will be safe to meet in person, as well as be located at the Maryland Live Hotel and Casino. The week will kick off with a keynote from former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, a celebration of the 19th Amendment, an access to justice event, and the annual meeting of the Maryland Bar Foundation and Fellows. Our CLEs will include our popular education programs, such as the advanced estate planning, real property, family and criminal law, consumer bankruptcy, and very popular business law and advanced tax institutes. There will also be our solo and small firm summit, culminating with our prestigious Bar Presidents Leadership Conference on Friday. So join us at Maryland Live. Now, to our local and specialty bar associations, many of your incoming presidents did
did not get to see the celebration that, uh, throughout the year because of COVID. So you didn't have your annual meeting. At this time, briefly, I'd like to just highlight each of you, give the congratulations you so well deserve and celebrate your rise to presidency within the local specialty bars across the state. Starting with Western Maryland, Allegheny County, the Honorable Jack Price, Frederick County, Janice Rockwell, Garrett County, Christian Nash, Montgomery County, Thomas Dagonia, In Northern and Central Maryland, we have Baltimore County, Jay Miller, Baltimore City, Darren Kadish. Out of Carroll County, Andrew Stone. Cecil County, the Honorable Bonnie Schneider. Harford County, Angela Deal. Howard County, the Honorable Laura Weathersby. Looking at Southern Maryland, we congratulate the following. Anne Arundel, John Dowd. Calvert County, Amy Lorenzini, who's also serving on our executive committee. Charles County, Molly Gorney. Prince George's, Yamiet Gutierrez. St. Mary's, David Weiskopf. Turning out to the Eastern Shore, we congratulate the following. Caroline County, Sarah Deal. Kent County, Pamela Duke. Somerset, Jennifer Turnbull. Talbot County, Ronald Lee. Wicomico, Raina Patel. And in Worcester County, the president is continuing, I'm sorry. Next, we turn to our local specialty bar associations. Alliance of Black Women Attorneys, we congratulate Michelle Wilson. Asian Pacific American Bar, Ann Grover. J. Franklin Bourne Bar, Benita Taylor. And the Maryland Criminal Defense Attorneys, Pauline Onimaki. And the Bankruptcy Bar, Catherine Hopkin. And the Maryland Hispanic Bar, Roy Lyford will be serving his second term, Roy Lyford Pike. Maryland Defense Council, Colleen O'Brien. The LGBTQ Bar, the second term for Laura McMahon. Maryland Association of Justice, Amy Orsi. Monumental City Bar, the Honorable Michael Stuttert, who serves on my bench. Everett J. Waring, Juanita Jackson Mitchell, Amand Altema. Women's Bar Association, the Honorable Tracy Parker Warren. Maryland Municipal Attorneys Association, Lynn Board. Maryland States Attorneys Association, Judy Arrington. The Simon Soboloff Jewish Law Society, second term for Laurie, the Honorable Laurie Bennett. Maryland Chapter of Federal Bar, Catherine Tang Newberger. So if you could join me in giving them congratulations for serving as we believe and in our partnership with our local specialty bars. I am thrilled now to introduce that the mid-year excursion is on and it's scheduled in beautiful San Juan, Puerto Rico, February 14th to the 20th at the Caribe Hilton, home to the first pina colada. Bill? <laughs>
renegotiate its substantially reduced room rates. There's no chartered flight, so you can use points, buddy passes, or book your airline directly with the airline of your choice. All of this is designed to make this the least expensive trip ever. There'll be great CLE programs, golfing. There's a private beach at the resort, a half day of service planned, and a reception with the Bar Association of Puerto Rico, in addition to many, many more surprises to come. So visit the msba.org website for more information about all of our programs and events throughout this year, including Legal Excellence Week and the Mid-Year Excursion. Throughout the COVID pandemic, the MSBA has and will continue to be here for you. We will continue to provide top-rated CLE programs, platforms for our sections, committees, and task forces to meet virtually and to make recommendations to create the changes that are needed in our legal system. You've heard how we've been the voice of Maryland lawyers with the legislature, the judiciary, and the governor's office. We will continue to interact with Chief Judge Barbera and Chief Judge Morrissey's office, as well as the administrative judges across the state to provide important announcements and protocols for each of the jurisdictions as they open up and dockets begin to resume there will be backlogs, and I know the judiciary is working hard to give people access to justice. To put it in perspective, a year ago, I was traveling in India. The headline of the India Times read, 140 cases pending in lower courts for more than 60 years, 51,000 cases pending for over 37 years, and a whopping 66,000 cases pending for over 30 years. I was shocked to read these numbers. In stark contrast is the leadership of the Maryland courts. In the commitment shown by Chief Judge Barbera, whose tenure has been marked by elimination of backlog cases in the appellate courts, we expect that track record will bear out as the courts reopen and the backlog will be cleared up quickly and timely and provide everyone full access to our courts. I want you to get the most out of your MSBA membership. Be engaged and informed. Let me know how I can make that even better for you. Now, I'd like to let you know a little bit about myself and my family and how I reached this moment in my life today. Growing up, I was always an overachiever, as my mother would tell you. There were a number of things in my life that gave me motivation and energy to strive to be the best that I could and continue to set an example to be proud of. Today is the last day of pride celebration around the world. I spent the last couple of days reflecting on LGBTQ history and my roles and contributions. During my college days as a young gay man, I was constantly bombarded with negative messages from all around me about what I would not be able to do because of being gay. This was destined to only work in certain professions and more likely than not, I would be dead of AIDS by the age of 25. Employers could and did fire you simply because you were gay. I knew this was wrong and I joined a group of individuals to help fight to change the law. We started in Baltimore City I remember walking into City Hall past protesters with signs that read, God hates fags, that I was going to hell and burn. I kind of thought the latter was a little funny because I associated hell with fire and thought it was a little redundant. But regardless, we were called lots of nasty names. People spit on the ground as we walked into the building. This only fueled my determination to fight against bigotry and for what is right. After all, it was my life that this was impacting. After many years of testimony before the city council, a bill was ultimately passed in 1998, providing protections on sexual orientation in public accommodations, housing, and employment. Man, that felt great to see change take place, and it was lawyers that helped make it happen. But that was a victory only for our city, and I wasn't satisfied. The next challenge was to work on statewide protections. I had been motivated to go to law school and use that education 
to not only understand the law, but to put it to good use, as I saw what lawyers could do. In 2000, in the year 2000, I was honored to get appointed with Judge Shannon Avery to then Governor Glenn Denning's special commission on sexual orientation, where we held hearings all over the state and we heard these horrific stories of LGBTQ individuals who had been fired or denied housing. The next year in 2001, the act passed and protections became statewide. We were on a roll as part of change. You can only imagine how thrilled I was a few weeks ago when the Supreme Court ruled in Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia, giving federal protection to gay, lesbian and transgender workers across the country. The next big issue for me was the emerging issue on marriage equality. I was cleaning out some old paperwork and came across literature from an organization called the Same Sex Marriage Coalition. We used when we were lobbying down in Annapolis back in 1996. Like Baltimore City, year after year, we'd go to Annapolis and testify. Year after year, the bill would never make it out of committee, yet alone some years not even up for a vote. Finally, Governor Martin O'Malley put forth a bill to allow same-sex couples to marry in Maryland, only to be put on a referendum for the people to ultimately decide. Meanwhile, one of the last cases that I worked on in private practice was Port v. Cohen, in which we argued before the Maryland Court of Appeals that Maryland should recognize out-of-state same-sex marriages under the doctrine of comedy. Our Court of Appeals agreed seven to zero. Earlier that year, while I was serving on the Board of Governors of the MSBA, I made a pitch to the Committee on Laws and ultimately to the Board of Governors about why the MSBA should stand up for marriage equality and not sit idly by on what was seen by some as a controversial and divisive issue. I was overwhelmed by the near unanimous support. Only one person voted against it and it was for different reasons. I was never so proud to have an organization that I had been a part of for my entire professional life stand up and say, if not us, then who? It was personal. President Henry Dugan presented passionate testimony in Annapolis in support of the bill, which ultimately was successful. Later the year, the referendum was passed by the voters and we were now allowed to get married in Maryland. Now, I was married three times. Some of you may have heard this story. Once in Vermont as a civil union, once in San Francisco, when Mayor Gavin Newsom was giving out licenses only to have it rescinded by the California Supreme Court and then again in Provincetown, Massachusetts. All of my marriages, however, have been to the same person, Michael Myers, my spouse. For over 20 years, he has supported, encouraged, and motivated me to continue pushing myself. Although we live on opposite coasts, he's in San Francisco, he continues to be a steadfast rock in my life, I'm forever grateful for his love and support. As I mentioned, he's watching in San Francisco with Mike and Matt, my stepsons. I tell you these stories because I hope it helps demonstrate my character and passion to pursue equality and inclusion and the place from where I come. No one should have to think I can only be X because of who I love or face injustice simply because of the color of my skin. We need to continue to ask, if not us, then who? Who will stand up against injustice, racial injustice, and violence? If not us, then who? We stand now in a time of unprecedented reckoning with racial injustice. As Chief Judge Barbera said earlier, we cannot falter as we must fulfill our mandate to ensure equal justice to all under law. Now, if we were in Ocean City, at this time, I would be introducing my family and friends who were present. Instead, 
watching from all over the country, some from my living room downstairs. I want to acknowledge my family and friends for their love and support of me over the years. I've been told I am the perfect blend of my mother and my father's personalities. When you meet them, I'll let you decide which part I got from whom. <laughs> anyway, my mom and dad, Dee and Frank Skirty, I thank them for their love and support. My sisters, Kim and her husband, Joe, niece, Chelsea, Emily and her husband, Ryan and son, Charlie and nephew, Joseph. My sister, Stephanie and her husband, Andy and my nephews, Jack and Ben. A special shout out to my extended family, Shannon and Sarah and their son, Wiley. Your presence in my life has added a new dimension to my legacy. I also wanna acknowledge a few of my friends, in particular, Sarah Longson, Judge Nicole Pastore, Judge Kevin Wilson, Judge Martin Dorsey, the three judges of whom I was appointed at the same time with, Tom Akeris, Mark Devlin, my friends in Ireland, and also that are watching in parts of the UK and former law clerk, Mark Postma, who's watching in the Netherlands. And finally, to all my colleagues, past and present of the Baltimore City District Court bench, under leadership of my administrative judge and friend, the Honorable Barbara Bear Waxman. With that, I would like to conclude by saying how humbled and honored I am to lead the MSBA and serve as your 126th president. Coincidentally, I was also the 126th president of the Bar Association of Baltimore City. I stand on the shoulders of our past presidents, many of whom have reached out and given me advice and guidance on how to be an effective president. The times are changing and I am looking forward to an exciting year and hope you will join me on this journey. From wherever you're watching around the country and the world, join me in celebrating the Maryland State Bar Association. Now, without objection, the 124th meeting of the Maryland State Bar Association is adjourned, sine die. Thank you, Mark. That is awesome, President Skirty. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, President Skirty. Thank you, Chief Judge. Thank you, President Skirty. Congrats, Mark. Great job, Mark. Thank Great you. job. Congratulations. Inspiring speech. Great job, Mark. Keep up the good work.